encryption is all about providing confidentiality. If you remember from the earlier lesson, confidentiality is the idea that only the intended recipient should be able to interpret the data you're trying to send. So the way that would work is let's just say my original data is the word hello. I'm going to put that through an encryption algorithm that's going to turn that into something that is undecipherable by anybody else. Now, the data before I encrypted it is referred to as plain text. It's also sometimes referred to as clear text. Those are both two words that mean the same thing. The data after it was encrypted is referred to as ciphertext. The idea is that the sender is going to generate some plain text, encrypt it, and then send it across the wire as ciphertext. The only person that should be able to take the ciphertext and turn it back into the plain text, otherwise known as decryption, should be the intended target, the intended recipient of the message. Now, what we are looking at here is referred to as simple encryption, where all we are doing is taking plain text and transforming it into something else. But there are problems with simple encryption. Let's talk about it. Let's say I have this blue user on the left over here trying to send the word hello in a secure fashion to this orange user. Well, he can use encryption to turn into ciphertext to send it across the wire. But let's now say the blue user wants to send the same word hello to this purple user. Well, it doesn't make sense for the blue user to use the same encryption algorithm they used before, because then the orange user will have insight in how to turn that back into plain text, or the purple user will know how to turn that back into plain text. Instead, for every user the blue user wants to speak to, the blue user is going to have to develop a new transformation. This way, the users they are speaking to don't have insight into what was sent on the wire. If the blue user wants to speak to yet another person, he's going to have to create yet another algorithm to securely transform the word he is trying to send on the wire. So as you can see, simple encryption doesn't scale. Every user that I have to speak to, I have to generate a new way of transforming text into something indecipherable. Which, by the way, is very hard to do securely. It's not a trivial thing to find a way to scramble text to make it uninterpretable by anybody else on the wire. It takes cryptographers and mathematicians years to come up with proper encryption algorithms. And if all I'm doing is simple transformation, I can't just use a publicly known algorithm because then the entire public knows the mechanism to decrypt. So instead, what the world uses is what's known as key-based encryption. Key-based encryption is going to combine a publicly vetted algorithm with a secret key. The algorithm itself is created by mathematicians and cryptographers and experts in the field. Moreover, it's vetted by each other, so they actually validate each other's work to make sure that the algorithm are secure. And then the secret key is just a random set of ones and zeros. And even though I'm using the same word to all three of these users and the exact same protocol for all three of these users, because I've generated randomly new keys for each user, on the wire, the ciphertext will look completely unique from one another. This way, the orange user has zero insight into what was encrypted and sent to the purple user, nor does the purple user have any insight into what was sent to the orange user. The cool thing about this is I can let the experts do the hard work of creating the algorithm, and it's very easy for me to randomly generate a set of ones and zeros to use as a key. This is what allows encryption to scale to the whole internet. Now, there are two ways to do key-based encryption. Those two ways are symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. And we'll be talking about both of those for the rest of this lesson. The main difference between these two is that symmetric encryption is going to encrypt and decrypt content using the same keys. And asymmetric encryption is going to encrypt and decrypt using different keys. So let's talk about what that means. To show you how this is going to work, we're going to use the alphabet. Now, for these examples, we're going to assume that there's only lowercase a through z. There's no uppercase characters, there's no numbers, there's no symbols. We're going to keep it simple for the explanation. Symmetric encryption uses the same key for encryption and decryption. So let's say I start with the word hello. I'm going to use a symmetric encryption algorithm in combination with a secret key. Now the algorithm I'm going to use for this example is simply moving the letters forward, and I'm going to move it that amount of times, in this case three. Well, if I start at the H and I move forward three times, I'll end up at K. If I did the same for the rest of the letters in the word, I'd end up with K-H-O-O-R. To decrypt this, I would simply take my ciphertext and do the inverse of the algorithm. So if my algorithm was to move forward, 
my decryption algorithm is going to be to move backwards, and I'm going to use the same key. So if I move forward three times to encrypt, I'm going to move backwards three times to decrypt. And if I start at the K, and I move backwards three times, I'll end up back at the H. And again, I could do this for the rest of the letters to decrypt the whole word. So that's a simple example of symmetric encryption. Notice, in particular, the same key was used for both encryption and decryption. Now let's talk about asymmetric encryption, and you're going to see it's a little different. With asymmetric encryption, I'm still going to use an encryption algorithm, but the keys I use for encryption and decryption are going to be different. Here, I'm going to use the encryption key of 5. Again, I'm going to start with H, and I'm going to move forward 5 times to get to M. I could do it with the rest of the letters in this word to get to M, J, Q, Q, T. Now, it might seem like you can just go backwards to get back to H, but in asymmetric encryption algorithms, the math features what's known as trapdoor algorithms. These are mathematical operations that can only be done in one way. You can't do them backwards. So in the case of asymmetric encryption, we can't actually go backwards. Instead, we have to go forward a different amount. To decrypt this, I'm going to have to take my ciphertext and use a different key going forward again. So starting with the M, if I go forward 21 positions, I'll end up back at the H. And I could do it again for the rest of the letters to decrypt the rest of the word. But notice, I went forward to encrypt and forward again to decrypt. Whereas in symmetric encryption, you can do forward and backwards. And of course, with symmetric encryption, I was able to use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. Whereas with asymmetric encryption, I had to use different keys to encrypt and decrypt. Now, let's talk about those keys a little bit more. Those two keys I used, in this case 5 and 21, are mathematically related. Whatever I encrypted with 5 could only be decrypted with 21. There are other combinations of keys that you could use in our little example using just the alphabet. Actually, anything that adds up to 26 would work. So I could have also used an encryption key of 6 and a decryption key of 20, or an encryption key of 10 and a decryption key of 16. But the interesting thing to note is here I used an encryption key of 5 and a decryption of key of 21. Well, what if I use them in the reverse order? What if I encrypted a 21? Could I not then decrypt with 5? Well, let's give it a shot. Again, I'm going to start at the H, and I'm going to see if I can move forward 21 times. That'll bring me back to the C, and I could also do the same for the rest of the letters. And then to decrypt this, I would again take my ciphertext and then move forward another 5 times. That would bring my C back to an H, successfully decrypting the first letter of my plaintext. I could again use the same decryption key to decrypt the rest of the letters. The main thing I'm pointing out here is this property of asymmetric encryption is that what you can encrypt with one key can only be decrypted by the other key, but it works in either direction. I can encrypt with 21 and decrypt with 5, or as we showed earlier, I can encrypt with 5 and decrypt with 21. These two asymmetric keys are mathematically related. Now, what the industry does with this is they take one key and they label it as the public key, and they make it available to anybody that asks for it. And then they take the other key and they call it the private key and they keep it to themselves. They never share their private key with anybody else. This way, anybody can use your public key to encrypt something, but only you possess the private key that allows you to decrypt it. Now, we're going to be talking about public and private keys in more detail in the next lesson. We're going to show you the different operations you can do with public and private keys. But for now, I want to continue comparing and contrasting symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Next, I want to tell you about the strengths and weaknesses of either method of key-based encryption. Now, you'll notice that these strengths and weaknesses are in relation to each other. The first one we're going to talk about is that symmetric encryption is faster. It's easier for CPU to do the math and work with the keys of symmetric encryption algorithms. Whereas asymmetric encryption is slower, it is harder math and uses bigger keys. Therefore, when comparing the speed of asymmetric encryption and symmetric encryption, symmetric encryption is much faster. Moreover, symmetric encryption has this interesting property that the ciphertext that you've encrypted ends up being approximately the same size as the plain text. The benefit to that is that when you put something through an encryption algorithm, that doesn't end up doubling or tripling the amount of data you have to put on the wire. Asymmetric encryption has the unfortunate property called ciphertext expansion, where typically what you end up encrypting with asymmetric encryption ends up being larger size-wise to what you initially had as your plain text. 
And finally, a weakness of symmetric encryption is that since you're using the same key on both sides, that secret key must be shared. That's a problem because you have to figure out how do we get the same key on either sides of the wire in a secure way. Therefore, symmetric encryption is considered less secure than its asymmetric counterpart. With asymmetric encryption, that private key never has to be shared. You never need to send that to anybody else. Therefore, since that key never needs to be shared, it ends up being more secure than its symmetric counterpoint. Now these strengths and weaknesses make symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption ideal for different usages. Symmetric encryption is ideally used for bulk data protection. That is, if you want to send a bunch of data from one party to the other, you want to use symmetric encryption. It's faster, it's more efficient, but unfortunately you have the problem that it is a little bit less secure. If, however, you only need to send a smaller data set, then go ahead and use asymmetric encryption because it's more secure. And since you're only using a smaller data set, you're not taking that big of a hit insofar as its slowness or the ciphertext expansion. So keep these strengths and weaknesses in mind, because in the next lesson, I'm going to show you how we use the strength of one to compensate for the weaknesses of the other. Otherwise, the last thing I want to show you in this lesson is just a few asymmetric and symmetric encryption algorithms, just so you know which are which. This list is a bunch of asymmetric encryption algorithms, DSA, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve DSA, and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Those are all asymmetric encryption which means they are more taxing on CPUs and involve values known as public keys and private keys. And these are a list of symmetric encryption algorithms, which means they are less taxing on CPUs and require the same secret key on either side of the wire. Now notice DES and RC4 are in red. That's because these algorithms have been considered completely insecure by today's standards. Generally, with symmetric encryption algorithms, the bigger the key size, the more secure the algorithm. But that isn't always the case Notice triple DES over here has an advertised key strength of 168 bits, but it is considered at best secure-ish. It's definitely a better choice than using DES or RC4, but ideally you start moving to using AES and ChaCha20 as the symmetric encryption algorithms you choose. Now the key sizes for the asymmetric encryption algorithms varies by different implementation and usage. Just to give you a comparison though, the recommended key size for RSA is 2048 bits. So hopefully that shows you some of the difference in so far as the key sizes between symmetric and asymmetric algorithms. Recall on the last slide, I told you that the key sizes for asymmetric encryption was much bigger. And so hopefully this proves that. Either way, that's it for this lesson. The main takeaways are understanding key-based encryption and the difference between symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption to include the strength and weaknesses of each. In the next lesson, we're gonna pick apart asymmetric encryption in more detail we're going to show you what you can do with public and private keys. But that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed that lesson, then you'll also enjoy the full course that it came from, Practical TLS. It's a deep dive into SSL and TLS, taught methodically and intentionally, full of easy illustrations and in the simplest way possible. You'll get to learn cryptography, certificates, private keys, the handshake, OpenSSL, and everything you need to become an SSL expert. To learn more, check out pracnet.net slash TLS. And if you need more convincing that this is the best TLS training course, then check out the other free lesson previews on YouTube. Thank you and have a great day.